Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Torres. All right, welcome to the audience in Carson City and those joining us by video conference in Las Vegas and those listening over the internet. I apologize, there's a couple tech issues up here today, so we have a couple people uh, stepping in to help us out with that. Uh, a couple housekeeping items. Please remember to silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you're done speaking. 20 hard copies should have been provided for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to the committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with another person's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes in addition. The public comment may be submitted by written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. We... We are gonna go ahead and take the bills out of order today. Um, so we are gonna start with AJR1 and then we are gonna go to AB113. Uh, and so I will be participating in the presentation for AJR1. So I'm gonna go ahead, and uh, we're gonna take a one minute recess um, so that our vice chair can assume the chair position. Good morning and welcome. I will now open the meeting, the hearing on bill number AJR1. This measure urges the United States Department of Veterans Affairs to study the effectiveness and use of the Hyperics oxygen therapy for uh, veterans. And Assemblyman MacArthur and Assemblywoman Torres, or Chair Torres, will be um, opening up the hearing on this bill when you're ready. <laughs> Good morning, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Richard MacArthur. I represent Assembly District 4, which is in the northwest part of Las Vegas. Uh, with me this morning is our uh, Chair for Government Affairs, Selena Torres, is gonna help us out with questions or things, right? Okay. Um, this morning I'm going to present Assembly Joint Resolution 1, 
which urges the United States Department of Veterans Affairs to study the effectiveness and use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for veterans and share the results with the state of Nevada. Now, there's only a couple of pages to this uh, resolution, and um, you know, there's a lot of whereases in it, and so most of everything is already covered in the two pages. So this will be a fairly short uh, presentation. Um, first, let me begin by uh, answering the big question, what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Um, HBOT, H-B-O-T is the letters they use for this, and I'll use that uh, while I'm talking. Basically, it's breathing pure oxygen. It involves breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized room or tube where the air pressure is increased uh, to about three times higher than normal so that the lungs can get a lot more oxygen. And this increase in blood oxygen temporarily restores normal levels of blood gases and tissue function. And this is what promotes the healing process and fights infection. Um, but to get the full benefit out of this, uh, most individuals have to um, take this treatment about anywhere from 20 to 40 times. Um, the United States Food and Drug Administration has cleared 13 different disorders for the treatment of HBOT, but the FDA has not approved HBOT as a treatment for PTSD or traumatic brain injury, TBI, Got a lot of those things. However, there are studies that have shown positive results by using HBOT to treat PTSD and TBI. Also, Congress created a commission in 2016 to examine mental health conditions and to do research on alternate medicine therapies, including HBOT. So there appears to be a real good reason to continue this research and study on hyperbaric oxygen therapy as it pertains to PTSD and TBI. And so this resolution is sending a clear message to the US Department of Veterans Affairs that this body supports the further study of HBOT for veterans in the hope that HBOT may lead to new solutions for persistent veterans disorders like PTSD and TBI. And that's basically uh, all I have uh, this morning. And um, I'll just say that there's no fiscal note uh, to this resolution. So open for questions. Yeah. Uh, Sullivan MacArthur forgot about me. No, um, no. <laughs> I'm a Sullivan Slanitaurus for the record. <laughs> I'm extremely excited to present uh, this joint resolution alongside my good friend and colleague, Assemblyman Richard MacArthur, who I, I, I also want to recognize, you know, is a Vietnam vet and served as a captain in the U.S. Air Force. Um, and, and together we are calling on an improvement to mental health and physical health outcomes and treatments for those that have served. Uh, moreover, uh, I think it's important to note that in this committee we have several individuals that have served. Assemblyman Thomas, who served in the U.S. Air Force, Assemblyman De Silva, who's a Purple Heart recipient and a Marine veteran. Uh, and as we review this resolution today, we urge our federal delegation and agencies to study the effectiveness, effectiveness of this new medical treatment, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We also recognize the ongoing mental health crisis that confronts Nevada veterans, and I hope that this is one step uh, in forward for our community. Thank you. We're open for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we have questions from Ms. Uh, Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and uh, thank you for bringing this forward and to all the vets in the house. Um, thank you. Yep, thank, thank you for your service. My, my question is, so what, just, just for information, what happens? We sign the resolution, should it pass? Um, thinking positively, it, it, it will, so it goes to our federal de delegation. What happens from there? As I'm going to for the record, so the hope is that this resolution will reach that of our, our, our congressional delegation, um, but also that of the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, um, and that they can take the steps necessary to study the effectiveness. I don't know if, if legal wanted to chime in any more there, but I, 
that's kind of the process. So this is a note, a resolution will notify um, our congressional delegation as well as the U.S. Department of Veteran Services um, that this is something that the Nevada legislature would like to see. So as uh, assuming that we are able to pass this out of both houses and get the governor to sign it, um, we'll be able to send that message there. If, if I may, thank you. If I may follow up, Madam Co-Chair. Um, thank, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So really, it just puts them on notice that, hey, we think this is important and to our federal delegation in particular, so get to work on it at a national level and hopefully it makes a difference. Yes, yes uh, Richard MacArthur. Uh, that's basically it. They've shown a lot of studies and a lot of them work, mm -hmm. but like the FDA, they haven't approved it yet yeah. as something for PTSD or TBI. Mm -hmm. But yes, we want them to keep working on it uh, mm -hmm. because it looks like it might be a good solution for that. That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you again for bringing this forward. It's really important. Uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez and then uh, Assemblyman De Silva. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to put on the record, I look forward to supporting your bill. Congratulations on your presentation as well. Thank you. <laughs> Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Assemblyman, uh, for bringing uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, bill forward. You know, I myself, you know, sought uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment back in 2007 uh, when I was uh, injured in the war, and it wasn't available to us. And this is at the Na at the uh, the Balboa Navy Hospital, the, the, the Naval Medical Center, San Diego. And uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows that it can actually help with uh, with treatment, with therapy. And uh, again, uh, it, it's been my opinion, my purview, really, that that the uh, that the VA and the also the uh, the uh, the DOD has been very uh, slow to move on this. So again, I'm I'm hoping that uh, you know uh, my fellow colleagues here in the assembly and the Senate can pass this uh, resolution, and uh, we can uh, urge our uh, federal delegation to take this all the way to the top and get this treatment uh, more available to our uh, not only to our veterans but to those of us who, those who are also serving currently in the in the armed services. So thank you again, Assemblyman, for bringing this uh, measure to, to to bear, and thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, for supporting. Uh, I call him a General MacArthur because he's such a, such a you know caretaker over the uh, the veterans community here. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, Richard MacArthur. That's what this uh, resolution does. It's we have seen a lot of help with this HBOT, and we want to push the administration to uh, keep the studies going because it looks like it will do some good help for our veterans. So, thank you. Any more questions, committee? I just have one comment. You look so happy presenting this bill, and um, I know you're going to help, and many veterans are going to appreciate you for bringing this bill forward. Okay, with that being said, we will now move into support of AJR1. Is anyone in support here in Carson City? Please come forward and state your name and spell your name for the record. Good morning to the committee, to the Assembly Committee on uh, Government Affairs. I am Tony Grady, and I am speaking on behalf of the United Veterans Legislative Council. And I'm not as good as Andy Lapill Belt, who would give you the total history of that, but when you pull in the council and their families, it's a significant number of people. The reason that I'm here today is I am. Um, speaking uh, for the bill, and this is very important, and I would just say I want to ditto what was brought before, but I will say as a background of, of being a pilot, I understand how important oxygen is to the brain uh, because of some other experience that I have with working with brain-injured children. One of the interesting things that happens is that when the brain is injured, the, the hurt part of the brain shuts down everything. So being able to get more oxygen on the cellular level to the brain is a, a therapy that we would like to have that is going to move forward. And we want to do anything we can to help our veterans. And uh, forgive me, uh, Chairman Woman Duran, for not uh, 
uh, saying hello to you, but to you and the whole committee, I would say the UVLC is for AJR1. Thank you. And thank you for that. Next, please. Thank you. For the record, Daryl Brown, representing United Veterans Legislative Council, U.S. Air Force veteran like my brethren here, Mr. Tony. Uh, yeah, this is a priority for UVLC. It's one of the highest ones that we ask that the uh, Assembly Joint Resolution 1 be a favorable outcome so that we can get this nationally. And we, I'm also hoping that uh, this will encourage other state legislatures to get involved in this process so that we can get hyperbaric oxygen treatments. I am a 100% service stable veteran. <laughs> and to answer your question, if I may, Ms. Taylor, it's a hope and a prayer. Uh, we've worked on this a long time. It gets closer every day. But we're working with a huge bureaucracy and it's a very political issue, so we appreciate your support. And ULVC asks that you vote favorably for AGR1. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Anybody else in Carson City for support? Anyone in Las Vegas for support of, a, of AJR1? Anyone on the phone lines for support? To testify in support of AJR1, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Madam Vice Chair and Committee, my name is Lynn Chapman. I'm a 48-year senior member of the American Legion Auxiliary, Doobie Reed Unit 30 in Sparks, Nevada. Don't the veterans deserve healing? Don't they deserve the best we can give them back to them for all their sacrifices? This is a study that deserves to be done for those that served us. Please vote yes for A.J. R1 for a study to help our veterans' health. You know, Congress needs to hear from Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no additional callers for support at this time. Is there anyone in opposition of AJR1 in Carson City? Is there anyone in Las Vegas in opposition for RJ1? Seeing none, is there anyone on the phone lines in opposition? To testify in opposition of AJR1, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in Carson City for neutral? In Las Vegas? Seeing none, is there anybody on the line in neutral for uh, RJ1? To testify in neutral for AJR1, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Good morning. My name is Joe Thiele, Executive Officer and Chief Financial Officer of the Nevada Department of Veterans Services, testifying in the neutral. Each spring proceeding in the legislative session, NDVS, along with the United Legislative Veterans Council, hosts the Nevada Veterans Legislative Symposia that allows veterans, service members, and their supporters to provide ideas of issues they would like considered by the Nevada legislature in the next session. During the symposia held in March of 2022, there was a recommendation that the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs should study the use of effectiveness and potential licensing of hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatment. As this had to do with a federal agency, this was placed on the federal issues list. 
and federal issues are not given a priority number at that, at that symposium. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, we have no additional callers for neutral at this time. Thank you. If we can have uh, Assemblyman MacArthur and Chair Torres, final remarks. Thank you, Assemblyman Torres, for the record. I just wanted to clarify one thing. With a joint resolution, we do not need the governor to sign off on it, so I just wanted to adjust my comments made to Assemblyman Taylor earlier. Um, so it just needs to pass both houses, and then the resolution will be sent off. Thank you. And just a couple of quick comments. I want to thank this. Oh, Richard MacArthur. <laughs> just want to thank this committee for letting me uh, present AJR1. Want to say hello and thank you to all the veterans in the building here today. And I also appreciate the bipartisan support that I've received uh, for this measure. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now close the hearing on AJR1. We will have a one minute recess. Thank you, committee members, uh, and thank you, Vice Chair. You did a phenomenal job taking over the committee. Uh, our next bill is going to be AB113. I will now open a hearing on AB113, which creates the Office of Early Childhood Systems within the Office of the Governor. And it's introduced by our colleague, Assemblywoman Thomas. Uh, when you're ready, you may begin. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chair Torres, Vice Chair Duran, and committee members. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Claire Thomas, representing Assembly District 17. It is my pleasure to present to you Assembly Bill 113 concerning the creation of the Office of Early Childhood Systems within the Governor's Office. Joining me today is Patty Oya, Director of the Office of Early Ch uh, Learning and Development at Nevada's Department of Education. Denise Tanata, Chair of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council. And to my right, Holly Wellborn, Executive Director of the Children's Advocacy Alliance. Before I begin, I would like to point out two exhibits which are both available on Nellis. First, you will find a presentation on Assembly Bill 113 and an overview of early childhood systems. And second, there is an amendment I am proposing to Assembly Bill 113. Early childhood systems refer to a comprehensive and coordinated approach to meeting the needs of young children and their families. This includes prenatal care programs and services to guarantee the best possible birth outcomes for both the mother and the child, as well as the support, the physical, emotional, social, and cognitive development of kids from birth to age eight. An effective early childhood system involves collaboration among various stakeholders, including parents, educators, healthcare providers, state agencies, 
and community organizations. Establishing an Office of Early Childhood Systems with the Governor's Office in Nevada is important to ensure that young children and their families receive the support they need to thrive. By coordinating programs and services across various state agencies and communities, the office could help to address gaps and redundancies in the current early childhood system. Second, the office could assist with improving the quality of early childhood education and care in Nevada. This could include supporting professional development for early childhood educators, promoting evidence-based practices in early childhood settings, and ensuring that children have access to high-quality early childhood programs. Third, our of an Office of Early Childhood Systems could help to promote equity and early childhood outcomes Children from low-income families and communities of color often face significant barriers to accessing high-quality early childhood programs and services. By focusing on equity and inclusion, the office could help to ensure that all children have the opportunity to succeed. In short, early childhood systems are important because they provide the foundation for a child's development and can have a lasting impact on their future success. Therefore, I and my co-presenters are happy to introduce Assembly Bill 113 to you today with the objective to make Nevada's early childhood system more effective by creating a formal governance structure dedicated to this purpose. Now I will hand the presentation over to my three co-presenters who will provide you with more details on Early Childhood System and Assembly Bill 113. Thank you, Assemblywoman Thomas. For the record, my name is Denise Tanada. I'm the um, chair of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council and also serve as the Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems Director at the Children's Cabinet. Um, our presentation today um, will cover four main topics. One, providing an overview of early childhood systems, um, what that is and what we're looking at. Um, for this office, providing some national context around this issue as well as Nevada context and then walking through um, specific provisions of the bill. Um, so starting with an overview of early childhood systems, um, we know that early childhood is a period of rapid learning, growth, and development that shapes the foundation for healthy development, um, lifelong well-being, academic achievement, and economic productivity. Um, we wanted to clarify that as defined by our state Early Childhood Advisory Council and as proposed in this legislation, the early childhood system means the governmental structure of the state and its political subdivisions that provide early childhood services related to nutrition, health care, mental and behavioral health, protection, and play and early learning that stimulates a child's physical, cognitive, linguistic, social, and emotional development. So essentially we're taking a very holistic view of early childhood development, um, looking at not just early learning, but all of those social determinants of health um, that impact growth and development. The framework for addressing early childhood systems has been developed based on the 2013 Build Early Childhood System Working Group model, which includes six key components. Um, the first is to define and coordinate leadership. Um, so this includes cross-sector decision-making and authority over systems issues. Two, financing strategically. Um, so looking at fiscal efficiency and coordinated financing strategies. Enhancing and aligning standards. So looking at streamlining and coordinating policies, practices, and procedures across the early childhood sectors. 
for um, creating and supporting improvement strategies um, with a family-centric focus, um, identifying strategies for program implementation that meet the needs of children and families. Five, ensuring accountability. Um, so looking at cross-sector coordinated data systems, um, reporting, and also having the ability to make data-driven decision-making. And then six, recruiting and engaging key stakeholders. Um, so establishing a system for integrating all key stakeholders with a focus on supporting the integration of parents and families with lived experience into leadership and decision-making roles. Um, early childhood systems government governance is being addressed in nearly every state, and there are multiple assessments of structures, as well as status of states, and developing those structures have occurred within multiple national organizations. Um, this, this slide depicts just three of those examples. Um, so some of those entities, the National Council of State Legislatures, um, has established an early childhood fellows program and has done articles looking at governance structure within the states. The Education Commission on the states um, has an overview of government structures and has also developed some state profiles. And then the Bipartisan Policy Center um, has issued a report looking at integrated efficient early care and education systems. Um, we'll talk about each of these a little bit more uh, on the next slide, but there are also multiple other entities um, addressing early childhood systems governance. Um, some of those are the, the Hunt Institute, which we know several members of our legislature are engaged with, um, a national organization, the Forum for Youth Investment, and at least three national initiatives that um, Nevada is involved with, um, the HRSA Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems Health Integration Initiative, the Pritzker Predatal to Three Initiative, as well as the Preschool Development B5 um, grant. So to provide a little bit more context on some of those national initiatives, the three examples that we've highlighted, there are really three um, top level takeaways. One is looking at executive oversight and the importance of that in the early childhood system. Um, the other is really looking at their different types of governance structures for early childhood systems, um, as well as key factors that influence um, government structure impact. Um, According to the National Council of State Legislatures, there are six states that have established early childhood agencies within their, um, with their directors and cabinet level positions. Um, and a key finding from their report is that elevating early childhood programs to state agency level creates opportunities to serve children and families more effectively through an integrated whole family approach. The resulting enhancements in program delivery, data collection, and data sharing can inform how young children and their families are supported and help to drive improvements. The Education Commission of the States looked at um, governance structures in early childhood systems and identified three. Um, the coordinated structure in which early childhood programs are administered by two or more agencies that collaborate and coordinate. Um, this is 29 states. Consolidated, um, which has multiple program functions consolidated, consolidated into an existing state agency, um, which is 13 states and the District of Columbia, and then created, um, and this is more of the emerging trend right now, that a new agency or office is created with the responsibility for most early childhood programs and functions, um, which is currently in eight states. Some of the key factors for the success of early childhood government structures and the impact um, from the Bipartisan Policy Center include analysis of the number of state agencies involved in administering core programs, the distribution of funding streams across those agencies, and institutional placement of key offices. According to the Bipartisan Policy Center analysis, um, Nevada ranked 40th. At this time, I'd like to pass over the presentation to Patty Oya. Good morning. This is Patty Oya, for the record. 
O-Y-A. I am the Director of the Office of Early Learning and Development for the Nevada Department of Ed. The slide that we're looking at now is a federal funding slide that shows the federal dollars coming in from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Agriculture, and Department of Education. These are just a few of the fund federal funding sources coming into Nevada. And then the lower half of the chart shows the, where the funding is going in Nevada into the different departments, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Education, Department of Agriculture. I think what's important here to keep in mind is that each funding source has its own reporting requirements, data collection, and accountability measures that are separated by each office. And for example, even under the Department of Education, you see funding goes into three different offices for early childhood services. That's the Office of Early Learning, Office of uh, Early Childhood Special Ed, our Office of Inclusive Ed, and the Office of Student and School Supports. So this chart is just a, a sampling of the federal dollars coming into Nevada. It does not include the general funds that the offices receive grants and foundational funds that, uh, that come into Nevada. The next slide looks at the early childhood data system, which could be part, is a main part of one, an early childhood systems because we have so many components of data that is collected across agencies, across programs, uh, across uh, our community partners, that the need for this data really is part of the system's work. So we look at child data, family data, classroom data, program data, and workforce data. All of those pieces should be pulled in together into one system. And you could see that it wouldn't be one system for, you know, and it be, would be one system that each agency or, or program feeds into so that we would have a comprehensive view of what what we still need, what's working. And I think, um, you know, for example, uh, if we collect data and if, and if you as a legislator want to know information, we often have to look at different programs, make different phone calls, trying to collect these pieces individually and not have a system. We don't have a system that I can just turn to and say, hey, how many kids are in pre-K? I know for you know, Nevada Ready State Pre-K is an example. I can get those numbers very easily. But then if you say how many kids are on a waiting list, how many kids are in Head Start, that's a, a lot of different information that I would have to pull from many different resources. So uh, this data system is a key part of the early childhood systems. Thank you, Patty. Um, Denise Tanata, for the record. Um, and I just want to know, when... In we are using the data system as one example of um, an infrastructure issue that needs to be supported um, in our state. I will, don't quote me on this, but I think our, the discussion of an integrated data system for early childhood, I think, goes back as far as like 2012, where um, there have been multiple reports, multiple discussions among um, various early childhood system partners um, to talk about what we needed to do with an integrated data system, but there really hasn't been a coordinating body to really take on that systems level work. Um, and the discussion, the concept of you know a coordinated office or executive level office um, around early childhood is not a new concept in Nevada. The early childhood um, system partners have been um, putting forward recommendations um, as far back as 2015, if not um, <clears throat> previous to that. Um, you know, recommendations to establish an executive level authority over early childhood systems in Nevada for all of the reasons we've um, discussed um, have been documented since at least 2015 and discussed well prior to that in the early childhood sector. Um, these are just four examples of those instances where advisory bodies or um, similar initiatives have recommended a more coordinated state level infrastructure. Um, those include the P20W Council, P3 Subcommittee, um, and their recommendations for building a comprehensive um, prenatal to three policy in Nevada. Um, as mentioned previously, the Nevada Pritzker prenatal to three strategic policy priority includes um, this recommendation. 
the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council 2022-2024 strategic plan um, includes the recommendation, and it was also brought up in the 2022 Northern Nevada Early Childhood Roundtable um, report. We also wanted to bring up, we had some recent information, um, as we'll discuss in a later slide, we have a lot of initiatives going on right now to look at Nevada's early childhood system and what we can do to make improvements. Um, one of those is a network analysis survey, which is really looking at how coordinated and integrated is our system right now? Um, where do those gaps exist that we need to fill in? Um, primarily looking at a lot of our state level agencies, but also incorporating some of those um, key um, non-governmental organizations that are um, critical to our early childhood system. And one of the questions <clears throat> that was asked in the survey is would the Nevada early childhood system be more effective with a formal structure within government, such as a state office dedicated to early childhood? Um, we just got the results of this report. Um, the survey last week, the report is not even out yet, um, but with 55 responses, 64% of respondents indicated yes to this question. Um, none said no. 27% um, or 15 out of the 55 respondents um, indicated not sure, and five of those had um, an other response to the question. Looking at uh, Patty Oya, for the record, looking at the Nevada contacts for the children enrolled in some of our early uh, early childhood programs, I think the notable, unfortunately, the notable number here is a 0.8 percent, so less than one percent of children eligible uh, receiving home visits. Uh, the number of Pre-K children is 15.8% of eligible children, and that's across three different types of pre-K programs. I think the numbers are low, uh, we believe, because if we look at the 2019 Annie E. Casey Foundation Report, the Kids Count Data Report that looked at from 1990 to 2017, the number of children um, in the the population for Nevada grew by 117%. That is the largest increase reported. If you, for context, Arizona's growth was 62% in that same time period of 1990 to 2017, and the national average for that same time period was 15%. So you can see that we had huge numbers of growth, but we, d we just couldn't keep up with that as far as infrastructure across the state for early childhood programs. I think that we have recently, and, and the next slide we'll look at some of the projects, but recently we did receive federal funding to not only address the pandemic responses and recovery, but to assess our current infrastructure and begin rebuilding. And just to give you an example, I think when we talk about Nevada Ready Pre-K, which is, again, what I know best, is that we have continued to grow those seats for four-year-olds whose families are at or below 200% federal poverty limit. But these seats, you know, if we our goal is to get to universal pre-K, we need to really think about the infrastructure, the building space, the teachers, the workforce, all of those things have to be in play in terms of how do we build the infrastructure, not just our desire to increase numbers of seats. The next slide shows the numerous systems projects that are either happening or wrapping up in terms of uh, in Nevada, and I, I think these focus on improving quality, provider supports, reducing costs for families, expanding access to services that meet needs of families, integration of holistic wraparound supports in early childhood settings, improving data collection and reporting, and accountability. And so you see these, this list of projects that are happening, and I, at the systems office level would be able to take recommendations, would be able to synthesize this information and make it a more useful and more uh, readily available so that we can understand where the biggest impact is across Nevada.
Thank you, Patty. At this time, we'd like to pass over the presentation to Holly Wellborn. I'm sorry, Denise Tanata, for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Holly Wellborn. I'm the Executive Director of the Children's Advocacy Alliance. It is uh, wonderful to be here before you all today to present on this important topic. Uh, my part of the presentation will focus primarily on the bill itself and the amendment that was presented. We did assist the Assemblywoman with developing that amendment. Um, of course, I won't be belabor the definitions, but the bill does provide on page three definitions of what early childhood is and what the early childhood system is. I think um, Ms. Tanada, Ms. Oya did a great job of um, explaining what that means in the larger context. But of course, we are talking about that uh, period of time prenatal through the, the age of eight years old in the full spectrum of systems, not just early childhood education, but health care. Uh, pre prenatal health care um, and the full spectrum of services and programs that children need to improve their outcomes. The duties and purpose of this uh, commission will be to analyze existing early childhood systems in relation to needs, evaluate the effectiveness of partnerships and coordination, improve equitable, equitable access and reduce disparities, and identify and make recommendations to the governor and the legislature related to unmet needs for comprehensive early childhood services, opportunities for funding, strategies to improve coordination and alignment, maximizing efficiency in the delivery of services, and integrating parents and families into leadership and decision making. What our goals are, I think it was it was clear before, but to, to make it abundantly clear, the goals are to mobilize resources around priorities for children, improve coordination and efficiency, facilitate a holistic approach to serving children zero to eight, strengthening partnerships with non -private, uh, nonprofit and private sector entities, and identifying and implementing strategies for fiscal efficiency and accountability, establishing integrated systems, and increasing equitable access to programs and services in the early years of childhood. So really trying to reach that gap, those folks that are not able to access services but who are eligible for the, those services but for some reason are not, um, uh, the, the system is too complex to um, you know, know and understand what you need to apply for when, how to access a particular program. That's what this would seek to resolve. For the amendment, there are just a couple of changes we uh, wanted to make in, in the drafting. The first, the amendment is on file for you. It does vary a little bit from what's presented on the slide as far um, as the, the second uh, amendment that we seek to propose. The first amendment, the purpose would be to allow the um, Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council to be part of the decision-making process for um, the, the candidates that the governor would consider to appoint to this particular office. That is very common. We've seen that in a lot of new commissions and boards that have been created, new offices that have been created. For example, the Department of Indigent Defense Services, the Sentencing Commission, those commissions make some recommendations because those folks on that committee have the best and the particular expertise to help the gover governor make the, the, that informed decision. The uh, second um, amendment that we are proposing, this is also common in newly developed commissions. It, it does vary. We were wanting to give an, a bill draft to that particular office, but um, typically what happens with the formation of these new entities is the um, there's a controlling board. So those boards I just gave an example of, Indigent, um, the, the Board of Indigent Defense Services, Sentencing Commission, um, they're given, uh, oftentimes when we're in that beginning stage process, and, and we want to ma make sure that recommendations are realized in the legislative session. And so we are asking that this committee consider giving the um, Early Childhood Advisory Council a bill draft um, to submit to the legislature that would encompass some of the recommendations that would come out of um, the formation of this office. Um, so with that, that is um, what we have for the bill. We're happy to answer any questions that you all might have. And unless the assemblywoman has any further comments, we can open it up for questions. Thank you.
Members, any questions? I'm going to begin with Assemblyman DeLong and then Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the uh, presentation. I'm just trying to understand the scope of what's being proposed vis-a-vis -vis the, the budget in Section 3. Um, looks like it's about a... The, the dollars look like it covers one person. Um, is that what's envisioned? Is that one person would be hired to do all this? Holly Wellborn, Executive Director of Children's Advocacy Alliance, for the record. Yes, that is what um, where the, the basis of where it would start. And I think um, there, there are some offices in the state that have started with one employee. And um, I believe Office of New Americans and a few others. Um, but it, it's really just to get the system started. And if they need to, you know, we can come back to the legislature and ask for further appropriations in the future. I'm sorry, Denise Tanata, for the record, if I could also um, just respond to the question um, and concur with um, Ms. Wellborn's statement. Um, also wanted to note that the governor's office did put in a fiscal note that I think would include three positions um, for this office with a little bit of a higher fiscal note attached to it. Um, so I think we're definitely open to, um, to any of those recommendations. Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the presentation and for caring so much about our, our little ones, our kiddos in the state. I have a question that's related to the same section that my colleague Assemblyman DeLong was in. And this is probably just as, as I'm new, I just want to make sure I understand the recommendation, whether it's um, um, as you've stated uh, in the bill or whether it's as uh, the fiscal note states, right, whether there's one person or three, is there are two fiscal years in here. So does that mean then that every, every biennium, it would have to be intentionally a part of the governor's budget in order for it to continue? One, one second. I'm going to go ahead and have legal answer that question. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Asher Killian, Committee Council. Um, so the, the bill as it's currently structured would provide specific funding for this office um, in the first and second years of the coming biennium. Um, I'll note that the amendment in section two of the bill amending NRS 223.085 um, gives authority to the governor to use any money available to the governor's office to fund this office in addition to the other offices housed within the governor's office. So ordinarily, the governor would, in following by any, uh, as part of his budget request, submit his total budget for his office, and then he would have authority to use that money within his office as he sees fit, including, um, per Section 2 of this bill, funding this new office. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Any additional questions? Okay, I do have a question. So what role uh, does this office have in addressing disparities in access to to pre-K so, um, and education services for from birth until the age of four because I don't see anything specified and I'm thinking about the gaps that we have as the state have for low-income communities, for students of color, and for rural students. Holly Wallborn, Executive Director of Children's Advocacy Alliance. I can um, address this question. I'm sure that Ms. Tanada and Ms. Oya might have um, a response as well. But when we're looking at all of these programs and these systems, if, if we go back on, on some of these slides, we take a look at the vast number of programs that exist that are early childhood programming. Sorry, I'm trying to find the appropriate slide here. It, that, that list is monumental. So when we're talking about issues of equity, when we're talking about those kids that are falling through the cracks, that are unable to access systems, it begins with that question of equity. It begins with those children who are living below the poverty, federal poverty level. It begins with children who have um, a hard time accessing services when they are dual lingual or um, unilingual students. It um, addresses individuals, you know, um, racial minorities, th th that's what these programs are meant to serve. So, I mean, that's the, 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 really the focal point is to meet that need. So when we're talking about this 117% increase, when this national average is at 15%, a lot of those children that are falling through the cracks, the vast majority are the, the exact um, communities that you're talking about. So in all of those systems, that's at the heart and, and, and the core of what it is that we're trying to achieve. 
Thank you. And I appreciate that response, but I do have a concern and I, I think that there would be room to include that in the legislation because I don't see anything that identifies like where the gaps are in services. I mean, we do talk about like, uh, like some of the needs for, for students for learning, the funding, but like none of the recommendations that would be made include that. So I just want to make sure that it's very explicit in the legislation because I do believe that's the intent of this conversation. Um, and I, I want to make sure that that becomes a responsibility of that office as well. I did have another question too, uh, another statement really, um, but I, I, I'm noticing if we look at section one, um, line 27 sub C, where it says identify and making recommendations to the governor and legislature, I would like there to be a timeline of that, like when that report would have to be submitted to the legislature and the governor's office. Um, that way there is something that would be submitted to create policy, because um, so, if we keep it that vague, that might not actually result in policy. Um, I do have uh, another question on like how we will measure the efficacy of this office. How will we know that this office is working? Holly Wellborn, Executive Director, Children's Advocacy Alliance for the record. Um, I think that the, that some of the measurements that are used in some of these offices that have um, that have, are in in different states, I believe Connecticut, Oregon, Florida, just a, a few examples. That measurement means that more people are accessing services across the board. So those numbers that we went through, that those numbers will increase. That that's the showing the tangible effects of access to to those um, those services, and then um, providing for you know the, that also shows you know the, the measurement of um, high quality services to show that you know outcomes for kids are really changing through the data that's collected. Denise Tanada, for the record, um, I want to apologize. It's hard to know who's going to take a question because we can't see their responses. But um, just on behalf of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council, I think it's our intent, and I think one we'd be open to any um, you know language changes that would help clarify the intent. But I think we are looking at the intent of being a very close relationship between the state Early Childhood Advisory Council. Um, with this um, this office with the governor, um, and in some ways, I would see that the role of the Early Childhood Advisory Council is to provide some accountability and oversight um, to look at. We do have metrics for our goals and objectives with the Early Childhood Advisory Council, which do incorporate some of those um, systems initiatives. Um, so, just. You know, speaking as the chair, I would think that part of our role would be to hold that office accountable um, to some of those those goals and metrics that we have in place for the early childhood system as well. Thank you. Maybe another note would be to have that director report to someone, right? Um, so I think in this case, it seems like the, the best place might be the Early Childhood Advisory Council for the director to have to report to that council um, regularly. I imagine any director that was working in this space would go to those meetings naturally, but I think that there, there should be a required reporting to that office. Um, additionally, I will note, um, I was just doing some research to see what we did um, in the legislature when we established the Office of New Americans. I believe it was in the 2019 session. And when I looked, one of the things that we did too to require that state agencies are working with this office, um, we did add a, a section, a language that said that there's a there's a need, a requirement to assist the office for state agencies. I think that might be something worth looking into that you know requires state agencies to be providing that information, providing that data. Otherwise, this office, you might have somebody requesting the information, that data, and it's still just not available. I'm gonna go ahead and go to Assemblyman Gonzalez. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask a, two questions. Um, on the slide when it says example of early childhood data systems, um, and it talks about like per provider data, are we requiring in this bill like a centralized data system? So are you requiring um, for there to be a place for all of this data, question one? Um, and then question two is what is the confidentiality around that data when we're talking about some of our really sensitive populations and how 
Um, are we ensuring that that data won't be used, um, you know, for unintended consequences? Thank you. For the record, this is Patty Oya. Thank you for the question. Uh, it, the data system, as Denise mentioned, is something we've talked about for a long time. But yes, it would be to pull all of these pieces in together so we could collect um, across. And it would be, in general, it's disaggregated da data, so children's names are not there. Um, but we don't even have at this time how many children are in different programs. We don't have information on our workforce in one it, we do have it, but it's not reported in one central place. So what what types of degrees do our teachers have? Um, how long have they been in the field? What's the turnover of the field? Um, are new people coming into the field? Those kind of workforce questions, we, we start to collect, but we don't have it in one place. And so that would be the purpose of the data system. And it is something that we've looked at in our federal preschool development grant in previous years and something that we've, we have information on, uh, further information on if needed. Thank you, members, any additional questions? Just on that conversation of data too, I would like that to be added, that requirement to the office that there is data um, because this is just a conversation but it's not in the bill. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that this conversation is demonstrated within the bill language. Um, I don't see any other additional questions from members. So I think we can go ahead and move into support. Thank you. Reminder to those coming to testify in support, you will have two minutes. Please make sure that you say your name for the record and spell your name for the record. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For, for the record, my name is Dr. Mary Perzinski, P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I. And I'm here representing uh, NAS, the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. That's an organization comprised of all 17 superintendents in the state. And we're in support of this bill and want to thank the Assemblywoman uh, for bringing it forward. This will, uh, first of all, put an emphasis on uh, early childhood, which we have not always had in the state. And it will um, help us analyze where we are and where we need to go. So we're in support of this and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee for the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas. Uh, the city of Las Vegas created the Start, Strong Start Las Vegas campaign to advocate for and bring awareness to the importance of early, hood, early childhood education from birth through elementary school. We created a Department of Youth and Development and Social Innovation. Um, we started the Strong Start Academies within our urban core area, as well as brought mobile pre-K to the urban core in the city of Las Vegas, because we believe this is an important um, thing for our constituents. Uh, this bill would address the challenges that exist due to the various services and support for young children that are currently housed under different statewide agencies with little collaboration and means of data collection. We believe this bill is an important step in support for early childhood services throughout the state and we are in support. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark. I'm here on behalf of the Children's Cabinet. The Children's Cabinet is a statewide nonprofit organization that works very closely with the state agencies and the other stakeholders that you've heard today in presenting this piece of legislation. We support AB 113. More importantly, we support the, this conversation, getting started, talking about early childhood as a system and looking at all of the different elements of that system that need to be supported. If we have one director, in charge of consolidating, looking at efficiencies, making sure that these resources, whether they come from the federal government, the state government, and even the local governments, are funneling down through that system to benefit the families, to benefit the kids, that's what we support. And we will look forward to working with the other stakeholders, answer a lot of the questions that were here. If we need to uh, further amend the legislation, uh, we will uh, look to do that as well. But thank you very much for hearing this bill. It's an important conversation that we need to have as a state. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Hello, Chair Torres and uh, members of the committee. My name is Eric Jang, E-R-I-C-J-E-N-G. I'm the Acting Executive Director for One API Nevada. Here on behalf of uh, uh, our API community that make up 392,000 people of uh, Nevada, 12.5% of the state's total population, and 7% of all our kiddos between uh, 0 to 6. And I'm here in support of AB113, but it's also noting that uh, we need a comprehensive system in order for us to see the data for uh, racial disparity, for ethnic disparity, because we cannot change what we do not see. And we're in support of AB113 to create that accountability and data system-wide. So it's a first step to create equitable change in early childhood systems, reduce disparities, and support our kiddos. And right now in Nevada, this is the 2022 data, 43%, two out of our five kids are uh, dual language learners. So as uh, Chairwoman Torres and uh, um, Assemblywoman uh, Gonzalo has already noted, this is an important part for us to make sure that we ensure their success at the early end. And last 40 seconds, I just want to note from uh, Chairwoman Torres' last session passed the ELL Learner Bill of Rights. I think this, with the early childhood system, that could be comprehensive, that can actually extend that, that will be an amazing support for our little ones here in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you, is there anybody else wishing to testify in support here in Las Vegas? Or here in Carson City, I apologize. I don't see anyone in Carson City, so we'll go ahead and go to Las Vegas. If you wish to testify in support, please make sure you state your name and spell your name for the record. Good morning, Chair Torres and esteemed Committee on Government Affairs. My name is Annette Dawson-Owens, A-N-N-E-T-T-E-D-A-W-S-O-N-O-W-E-N-S. -T -T -E -E I am grateful to serve as a School Readiness Policy Director for the Children's Advocacy Alliance. I'm speaking today especially as a parent and an advocate for Nevada children. The Children's Advocacy Alliance has had a long history of listening to, working with, and training parent advocates and children's advocates in general. We hear their stories, and often they testify here before you on issues that have affected, sorry, that have affected them and their families. They share concerns and they put their energy into working to make the system better for other families and children. Their voices and their lived experiences are incredibly thoughtful and shed light, sorry, incredibly insightful and shed light on the needs in Nevada. And they often end up leading much of this work. As testified here today, the majority of key early childhood stakeholder responses said we would be more effective with a formal structure in the governor's office, and no one responded no or to the contrary. We ask you to support AB 113 and establish the Nevada Office of Early Childhood Systems within the office of the governor. I truly know and believe this bill will move Nevada forward in ways that we have not achieved in the past. I am especially grateful for all my colleagues that have testified here today, for you and all your efforts, especially Assemblywoman Thomas, and for your considerations of this bill. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, um, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Amanda Habush Deloy, A M A N D A H A B O U S H D E L O Y E, and I am the Executive Director for the Nevada Institute for Children's Research and Policy, and the Southern Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council lives within our center. However, I want to make it clear I'm not here today representing um, the Nevada Institute for Children or UNLV, but I'm here representing myself as a um, resident of Nevada. Um, I just want to, you know, testify as somebody who was born and raised here and has had um, benefit of some of these systems and to look and to have colleagues and, and friends and representatives and families who share with us some of the struggles that they have navigating some of these systems and also hearing some of the wonderful successes um, from successfully navigating these systems. We can see that working together, collaborating, and an integration of these systems will only move our state forward and focusing on early childhood is the way that our state is going to thrive and be successful in the future. Having a position within the governor's office is 
will allow us to be able to advocate and educate on a daily basis to bring the recommendations our community members have been making as a team for many, many years to make sure that those recommendations get heard and move forward each day. We know when there's dedicated staff and there's dedicated time and a person in order to um, advocate for those things every day that we are more likely to succeed and to move them forward and for individuals around to understand that the power that these systems and integration can have. So there Therefore, I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in support in Las Vegas? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and go to the phone. So BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in support on AB 113? To testify in support of AB113, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're unmuted on our end. Can you please make sure that you are unmuted on yours? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Torres and members of the committee. My name is Leslie Pittman, L-E-S-L-E-Y-P-I-T-T-M-A-N. And I'm here today on behalf of the Waterford Institute, a nonprofit organization that partners with families, school districts, educators, and communities to help every child build the skills they need to succeed in school and in life. We applaud Assemblywoman Thomas for bringing AB 113 forward, and it's designed to create an Office of Early Childhood Systems within the Office of the Governor. As Ms. Kanata indicated in her presentation, several states like New Mexico, through its Early Childhood Education and Care Department, have created a cabinet-level entity designed to optimize the health, development, education, and well-being of babies toddlers and preschoolers through a family-driven, equitable, community-based system of high-quality prenatal and early childhood programs and services. Nevada should do the same. While we've made some improvements over the last decade, and those should be applauded, Nevada continues to fall woefully short on a number of child well-being indicators as determined by the NE Casey Foundation's 2022 Kids Count Report, which ranked Nevada 47th in child well-being. In particular, the report indicated that 63% of Nevada three and four year olds do not attend any sort of school. That is due in no small part to a host of barriers that exist to families who live in rural areas with limited preschool options, transportation challenges, affordability, and cultural preferences. This is a travesty when one considers that 90% of a child's brain growth occurs during the first five years of life. It is time for a cabinet level focus on these unmet needs and how to effectively develop a robust and comprehensive approach to the provision of early childhood services in Nevada. We agree that improving coordination, increasing efficiency, implementing opportunities for increased family engagement, and maximizing the use of federal and private dollars will lead to better outcomes here in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Chair, we have no additional callers wishing to testify in support. Thank you. I will now invite anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB 113. I don't see anyone here in Carson City, Las Vegas. I don't see anyone in Las Vegas. VPS, can you see if there's anyone on the line wishing to testify in opposition to AB 113? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no additional callers for opposition. Thank you. I will now invite anyone wishing to testify in neutral on AB 113 up here in Carson City, in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone wishing to testify in neutral to AB 113? Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no callers for neutral at this time. And I'll invite the bill sponsor to give any closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am so excited, I really am, because this is the foundation building for 
our kiddos to start with something that has been missing in our state. We have other states that um, are competitive with us, and we need to, you know, uh, get up from being 48th, 50th, 49th, 48th, 50th, and I think this is a start. This council will actually, being in the governor's council, would be a voice for those that cannot speak, and that's our little ones, that's our kiddos, and I look forward to um, asking you to support AB 113 because it's a start. This is the foundation. This is what we've been lacking. This is what that Hunt Institute that um, Senator Wynn and myself and the governor's office and um, the um, Early Childhood Education Office, this is what we, we did back in August to sit and listen to the other 50 states um, and see what their programs were about. And we came up with um, this council along with the advisory council. And this is that foundation that this is what is needed in our state to build upon our kiddos that are like sponges. They want to learn. And we need to do that. And I'm asking this committee to please push this forward for our kiddos in the state of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Thomas. And I don't think I can think of any more synonyms for the word child, but we really appreciate your testimony on AB 113. Um, thank you. At this time, we will go ahead and close the hearing on AB 113. And I will invite anybody wishing to testify in public comment here in Carson City. In Las Vegas, is there anyone wishing to testify in public comment? As a reminder, everyone has the opportunity to speak in public comment. I'll have an additional two minutes. Please make sure you state your name and spell your name for the record. After those two minutes are up, I probably will cut you off. Um, BPS, can you check if there's anyone on the phone wishing to testify in public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. That is a first. I'm surprised. Any remarks from committee members? Assemblyman MacArthur? No, he spoke enough for today. Um, <laughs> tomorrow we will be meeting in room 3143 downstairs. Just as a reminder to committee members, we will not be in this room. We'll be down on the third floor. Um, tomorrow we will have a presentation from the Secretary of State's office and we'll be hearing two bills, AB 96 and AB 59. So please come prepared. Uh, thank you. This meeting is adjourned.